when we, when we look to curate an evening, we always look for sometimes common strands in, in the speakers. But what is remarkable about both speakers today is that they deal with radically different worlds that transcend both ancient and modern. They interpret them in uniquely personal ways. But their own journeys are also linked with this journey from the ancient to the modern. If Amish deals with the classical traditions of India, Jonathan Gill Harris deals with the revered landscape that is Shakespeare. When you take the landscape of Shakespeare, you add in a cocktail of chaos and complexity like India, and then a very personal journey of discovering both, you have a conversation that transcends not just a personal memoir, but it becomes a critical journey, both of literature, of this landscape, and of how the very intersection of both can change both forever. This is a conversation we're particularly privileged to have, because at the heart of this, what Jonathan is exploring is uniquely the idea of India. For a conversation around Shakespeare, that should be a great starting point. Jonathan, can we have you up on stage, please? Thank you, Pius. I feel like I have absolutely nothing to add after that wonderful introduction. I'm, I'm quite happy for you to keep talking about me. I'll just walk out slightly embarrassed, but... Uh... We, I, I know exactly because I've been, I've been going through the book. And the starting point for this conversation is, of course, Jonathan teaches English at Ashoka University. He's professor of English at uh, Ashoka University. But he, has, he was born in New Zealand. He, schooled, he educated in the UK, and then he taught for 23 years in the US. Shakespeare being a particular passion, and I think for 25 years. The interesting thing, though, is how that passion for Shakespeare has evolved after your love story with India. So let me start by saying, before India, what, was, what drew you to Shakespeare? Boy, that's a difficult question out of the box. It, it, here's a shameful admission. Shakespeare, for me, was an arranged marriage. And at the beginning, I had no love for what was to be my future partner. <laughs> you can see the direction in which we're headed with this. Obviously, we're going to end up in India. But, uh, you know, some of us grow up loving Shakespeare. Some of us have Shakespeare thrust upon us. And I was definitely in the latter category. Shakespeare was taught so phenomenally badly at school. Um, I was saying to Bail before that there was a way in which uh, Shakespeare classes were a little bit like visits to the dentist. You knew that you had to do it, but you just wanted it over and done with as soon as possible. Because you were guaranteed health, but also a heck of a lot of pain on the way. And the teachers did everything they could, poor things unwittingly, to make it as painful as possible. Because they themselves often didn't understand the first word about this supposedly sacred text that they felt it their moral duty to, to teach to us. I remember there was one teacher in particular who would read incoherently from, from Shakespeare. We were studying Macbeth at that time. He'd mumble over the lines, he'd botch up the words, and then he'd look at us just like this. And we realized that was our cue to say, yes, how true. We didn't know what was true, but it was meant to be true. Uh, so I arrived at university with, if anything, a complete loathing for, for Shakespeare as that difficult, stuffy guy in the corner. Uh, but I also had a love of theater. And some of my frostiness to Shakespeare had been thawed by productions I'd seen. And I hesitate <laughs> to add that they were really bad productions uh, performed by people who also didn't know how to speak Shakespeare, pronounce Shakespeare. But there was something about the stories that grabbed me a bit. But still, the idea of taking classes in Shakespeare, especially at the university level, didn't appeal particularly. And it's amazing that a professor of Shakespeare, as an undergraduate, I never took a Shakespeare class. I, I tried to avoid. There were classes in which Shakespeare was unavoidable, but a whole class in Shakespeare I never took. But at the end of uh, my undergraduate education, I appeared in an awful production of Midsummer Night's Dream in a bit part. 
And on the strength of that, or on the weakness of that, I was press ganged by the English department at the Auckland of University to teach a course in Shakespeare. They must have been really desperate. Uh, and to make things worse, the first day of my class, there was someone in the front seat who turned out to be my student, but my jaw dropped when I realized who he was. He was a famous Shakespearean actor in New Zealand. I thought this was going to go really, really badly. Uh, his name was Michael Hurst. Uh, we became very good friends. And it was actually talking with him about how Shakespeare was a performer, an entertainer, rather than uh, some sort of lofty, abstract, ethereal devta. Uh, who was the font of truth, that alerted me to a dimension of Shakespeare's plays that, to a large extent, had been dormant for me. Uh, I fell in love with Shakespeare by teaching Shakespeare and by hearing Shakespeare. And I'm a musician. I began to recognize the music in Shakespeare. This was something that had been stamped out of Shakespeare as he was taught, at least at the high school level. I believe he's often taught the same way here. So many students come to me saying, in his novel Hamlet, Shakespeare says that, completely forgetting that he wrote plays that were meant to be heard, and plays that were not plays in the modern sense of prosaic dialogue, but plays full of music, full of rhythm, full of cadence. And so I began to hear the music. But it took coming to India to teach me something else about Shakespeare. And it took Shakespeare to teach me about India. And this book is very much about that dialogue and how an arranged marriage turned into a relationship of, well, true love. So in, so in fact, that leads me almost neatly to where I wanted to start with the book itself, because you start by, uh, early in the book by talking of what you say is a particularly Shakespearean experience of watching the film Lagan at a movie hall, a particular movie hall called the Chanakya in, in Delhi, where you had an epiphany. Will you tell us why watching Lagan in a New Delhi movie hall gave you an epiphany about Shakespeare? So, I can presume that most of you have seen Lagan, yes? I mean, it's such an iconic film. I'd seen Hindi films before, but only on video in, in America. And I liked them well enough. I, I thought they were weirdly bizarre. I'm, part of me was drawn to how these improbably sentimental narratives would always be interrupted for no reason whatsoever by item numbers in which people would suddenly start dancing. But nothing had prepared me for the experience of being in an actual single screen cinema hall. Uh, and the Chanakir Theatre in Delhi in 2001 was unlike any cinema I'd been in. I was used to cinemas in the West where people would sit in the dark very politely and um, watch a film and sometimes whisper to each other. Uh, Walking into the Chanakya, I knew it was going to be a very different experience because it wasn't a theater, it was a bazaar. Uh, there were so many people. And I was struck instantly by how you could pay a low fee to sit in the seats at the front downstairs. And you could pay even more, as we did, to sit up on the balconies. And straight away, I thought, oh, that's exactly what Shakespeare's original audiences did too. Uh, his audiences were every bit as economically diverse as the audiences you find, used to find in the single screen cinema halls. Uh, so I was already thinking, this is interesting. Then the film started <laughs> and my life changed. Uh, it wasn't so much that I thought Amir Khan was absolutely wonderful, though I did. But something happened when his character's introduction song started. You remember it? Oh, Mitava. Sun Mitava. Tujko kya dar hai re. Ye terti 
अपनी है अपना हम बार है रे आ जा रे नाउ द पीपल इन द सीट्स डाउनस्टेयर्स हैड स्टार्टेड स्क्रीमिंग द मोमेंट आमिर खान अपीयर आई थॉट दिस इज बैड बिहेवियर started flinging coins at the screen they were standing up in their seats and as soon as mithava started they started singing along i thought my god they know the song already while the people in the balconies were anglophone and saying oh yes yes nice song they were much more anglo in their response but they were still very much in sync with the people down in the pit who were singing along and i suddenly became absorbed at that point i understood absolutely no hindi I recognized there was something in the song that was inviting me yet dirty apni hai inviting me into the terrain of the film and you know the plot doesn't bear synopsizing it's so straightforward indian cricket team plays an english cricket team english cricket team is captained by um colonizing villain indian cricket team improbably kicks butt of english cricket team we know what the result is going to be right from the beginning but that's not the point the point is what happens in between not only on screen but off screen because that cricket team held up a mirror to the audience it was a very diverse team yes mostly hindu but there was a muslim there was a sikh there was even a dalit it was coached by a woman an english woman no less this is how inclusive the film was and i thought it, it suddenly occurred to me no matter how unrealistic this film is and my god amir khan's pectorals in a, a a gujarati village in 1890 where where people have been suffering from famine for 3 years to have pectorals like that this is so unrealistic <laughs> yet there was something deeply realistic about the film too because it was insistent in saying we are like this we don't come from one community we don't even speak one language but we come together to sing this song and we're brought together by that pronoun apni which you can't translate directly into english right apni is a much more inclusive pronoun than say hamara hamari uh, so this film spoke to me but it also made me think again the shakespearean space in which rich and poor mix just like in shakespeare's globe shakespeare had to produce entertainments for this mixed audience in exactly the same way that amir khan had to in the single screen uh, and the masala movie as a genre rather than being this ridiculous escapist thing this b grade uh, low brow form of entertainment that we're used to dismissing it as being is in fact very shakespearean because shakespeare was doing the same thing having to deal with multiple constituencies in his audience poor and rich protestant and catholic something i came to learn over the years too was that hindi films aren't really in hindi at all i realized this when i was taught hindi by someone who taught me a language that no one has ever actually spoken it was so heavily sanskritized um that uh, <laughs> when i tried to speak it after moving to india it was not the language people spoke on the streets of delhi but the language of hindi films was hindustani it was a mixture of hindi and urdu and english and punjabi and bhojpuri and shakespeare's english was never english it came to be regarded as english 100 years later but shakespeare had to write in multiple dialects because his audience came from all over england they came from the aristocracy and spoke a very latinate dialect they came from uh, the norman gentry and spoke a very french drenched dialect they came from villages and spoke a very anglo-saxon dialect they came from the north where they spoke a very scandinavian dialect and shakespeare had to mix this all up he mixed up prose and poetry tragedy and comedy french latin scandinavian anglo-saxon in exactly the same way a hindi film mixes up 
Hindi and Urdu, and tragedy and comedy, and dialogue bazi with Nach Gana. Uh, all of a sudden, Shakespeare seemed to belong to a universe for me that was much more tangible after that experience in the Chanakya. And ditto, Masala movies, rather than being simply ridiculous anthropological oddities, I'd already seen Shole, I knew the line, you know, Tere kya hoga kalya. <laughs> uh, but all of a sudden, Masala films seemed to me not lowbrow at all. They seemed to be deeply invested in an idea of India that was fundamentally mixed, that was about upani, just as Shakespeare's drama is. Um, so, um, at the heart of the conversation that we're going to have is, of course, the movies and Hindi movies. But even before we come to that, it's interesting that you traced uh, what many of us take so for granted that we don't realize how remarkable it is, which is the prevalence of Shakespeare usage in everyday life, ranging from our politicians to the fact that uh, Shakespeare Sharani in, in, in Kolkata is a very, very, it's just a part of town, right? Will you tell us a few of, what, of these examples that you found particularly remarkable? Because to us, they're, they're commonplace. Yep. I mean, Shakespeare is everywhere in Indian culture. And this is partly, of course, a legacy of British colonialism and uh, our friend Thomas Macaulay's conviction that Indians needed to be um, inculcated uh, into English culture. Uh, so that uh, English colonialism could, could triumph. It's no coincidence, but many Indians don't know this, the very first place in the world, the very first university in the world where Shakespeare was taught, Shakespeare had never been taught for 200 years, he was simply entertainment, but he began to migrate in the 19th century into university classrooms as literature. And guess where? Of course, everything that happens in India happens first in Bengal, Presidency University in 1822, Shakespeare for the first time in the world was taught as literature. Uh, by the 1850s in Elphinstone College in uh, Bombay, uh, Parsi students, other uh, Bombay Wallers, were committing Shakespeare passages to memory. Um, these people would take their revenge uh, on what must have for even them felt like a visit to the dentist uh, by writing these wonderful parodies of Shakespeare that became an integral part of the Parsi theatre, which was in turn what morphed into Hindi cinema and Bollywood later. These Nachgana versions of Shakespeare, comic versions of Hamlet. Hamlet the Omelette uh, was, was a popular one. Um, but Shakespeare spread everywhere, and not just because of the effect of colonialism. I think it was also because people sensed it an affinity of some kind, that Shakespeare was up knee. Uh, so he started popping up in all sorts of improbable places. Uh, uh, Kerala communities, fishing communities, staged a version of Pericles, for goodness sake. There's something about Pericles, Shakespeare's story of a guy who survives not one but three shipwrecks, really resonated for Malayalis. Uh, but I think there were a number of uh, aspects of Shakespeare's craft, and in particular his investment in mixture, that immediately made sense to Indians. And it's why the famous Oxfordian uh, Shakespeare critic C.J. Sisson in the 1920s came to India and was taken to see a Parsi theatre production, bowdlerization, vandalization of a Shakespeare play. And he sniffed and said, this is going to be ridiculous, so I'll go and see it. And he was astonished. At the end of it, he said, this is more Shakespearean than the stuff that masquerades as Shakespeare back in Britain. We have forgotten something about Shakespeare that is still alive here in India. And it had to do with this extraordinary mixture that he witnessed in the Parsi theaters, where people speaking many languages, Marathi, Gujarati, Urdu, Hindi, uh, Tamil, uh, were conversing with each other, and the plays had to somehow converse with them. For him, 
that was the essence of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. But um, as you've said, Macaulay and colonialism may be the start of the formal teaching of Shakespeare, but they don't explain the essential resonance. And that essential resonance, you boil down to the one word, masala. And you have an interesting interpretation of masala. Tell us what to you is masala, what is masala about Shakespeare, and what is masala about Hindi movies, Indian movies? You know, I hesitated for a long time about putting the word masala in the title, because I thought, you know, it's just too easy. A gora comes along and writes about Shakespeare in India, just throw masala in and it'll sell. Uh, masala is a word that, uh, at least in a Western context, is so easily attached to Indian products, you know, Mississippi masala, etc. Uh, but uh, for me, masala began to acquire real force as a term that helped me understand aspects of Indian culture and aspects of Shakespeare. Uh, masala means, of course, many things. That's part of what attracts me to it. It can't be pinned down to any one thing. It comes from an Arabic word, masale, that means ingredient. So masale, and the plural became a mixture of ingredients. Um, and it migrated from Arabic through Persian into um, northern Indian languages and southern Indian languages as well. Um, and over time, it came to be applied to many things. I love that particular usage of adding masala to a story. You know, that every time a story is told, you've got to add masala to it. The point is not whether the story is true, the point is whether the story tastes good. You know, you've got to add something to it with every retelling. And it seemed to me that was a good way of explaining Shakespeare, too. Uh, we think of Shakespeare as a great original writer. In fact, he wasn't, even as he was a great writer. Of the 37 surviving plays, 35, he basically cut and pasted from other sources. He picked up bits from here and bits from there. Hamlet. His iconic play is based on a play called Hamlet, not written by Shakespeare, which is based on an earlier play called Hamlet, which is based on an earlier story called Hamlet of Belfast. Uh, but the point is that Shakespeare didn't see himself as an original artiste, which is what he's been turned into. If anything, he saw himself as a chef. And when a chef is cooking, she is not coming up with an absolutely new concoction. She's always working with, or he is working with, something familiar. Uh, otherwise, uh, the people that she or he is cooking for are going to say, what the hell is this? Uh, they want familiar recipes, but with a new twist, with masala added. And that's exactly what Shakespeare did. It. And so that was part of the reason. But it was the masala movie that I was most attracted to. And masala as a genre that appeared in the 1970s and 1980s with Manmohan Desai um, and uh, Ramesh Sippy's films uh, greatly interested me because they were so denigrated as B-grade, as escapist. Yet, as exercises in dreaming about an India that is comprised of mixture, I thought they were anything but escapists. They recognized something about India, uh, that India is not one. It doesn't derive from one original point in time. It doesn't derive from one tradition, but from a confluence of traditions. India is a series of ongoing conversations, and that is part of its beauty and its richness. That's part of Shakespeare's richness, too, that he is not an origin who invented all these stories, but rather he's a conduit that allowed for the confluence of so many different traditions, French, Italian, English, even, as you will see if you read the book, Arabic, Sufi. Romeo and Juliet is based on a Sufi tradition of love that Shakespeare somehow channeled. Uh, so I wanted all these ideas of masala to be at play in the book to help people recognize what is so wonderfully plural and syncretic about Shakespeare, but what is also so wonderfully plural and syncretic about the India that I love. Uh, and I want to stress that. This is the India I love. Uh, it's also an India that I fear is 
under threat right now. So when, when we speak of the movies in particular, there are the obvious uh, you know, movies that are based on plots directly that are Shakespearean. But then there's also, as you see, a Shakespearean way of seeing. You know, so will you tell us about a, a films that you think answer to that intent or that way of seeing that is Shakespearean rather than the, say, I mean, Vishal Bhardwaj's films, for example, are an obvious uh, takeoff point both in story and interpretation. But what is the Shakespearean way of seeing that is so prevalent in, in Indian cinema, not just Hindi cinema, but, but all parts of the country? So it's no longer a shameful confession. I can stand in front of you and say I'm proud of this. What I love most about Nach Gana is the Gana. <laughs> item numbers. And uh, we're living at a time where item numbers are now regarded with a great deal of prurient suspicion. Karan Johar has said very sanctimoniously, I will not have item numbers in my films anymore because they're sexist. And although it's true that historically, and especially, unfortunately, in the last 20 years or so, uh, item numbers have often focused on scantily clad women uh, for a presumably male gaze. That's not the part that is important about an item number. Uh, the part that's important is the song and the lyric. And it's the lyric of item numbers that is, for me, the most Shakespearean part of not just Hindi film, but also of a variety of Indian film traditions, including Tamil film, by the way. I saw Peta recently with uh, Talaiva. Um, and I was absolutely in raptures. I, I think that film, by the way, is the South's masala revenge on the North, uh, because the, the plot, I mean, it's just so wonderful, wonderfully improbable. Uh, so it's set in a boarding school. You, how many of you have seen Peta? It's set in a boarding school in the north where everyone, for some reason, speaks Tamar. Um, and uh, there are two kids at uh, this boarding school. One is Muslim and one is Christian. And the Christian is bullying the Muslim. Enter Talaiva, um, a man with a past. And we don't find out about the past till the second half of the movie. But he's the hostel warden the Hindu hostel warden who brings together the Muslim and the Christian who'd been fighting each other and brings them into friendship. And then the three of them take revenge against the true villain who is a Gauraksha, Valentine's Day, Eve teaser, thrasher uh, from the north, played no by Nawazuddin Siddiqui. And they seek revenge against him. <laughs> uh, this is a very masala film. It also, celebrates sorry, pluralism. but just to add, it's also interesting that the term for, for, for the vigilante groups against them are anti-Romeo squads. Yes. So that's another Shakespearean <laughs> reference right there. Uh, and Yogi Adityanath Bechara. <laughs> what can I say? He has not read Romeo and Juliet as well as I'd like him to. <laughs> if he thinks that Romeo is a sexual harasser... <laughs> He's clearly not read the play. Uh, what are the most gripping adaptations that you have found of uh, Shakespeare's plays, whether directly or indirectly, across the landscape of cinema in this country? I know it's a very expansive question, but if you could name even three or four. Uh, well, I think it's hard to go beyond Vishal Bharadwaj's uh, trilogy, um, especially Omkara, which I, I, I think is a phenomenal film. Um, but I also want to do a shout out for some southern films uh, that you may or may not know about. Uh, there is, of course, the uh, uh, Malayalam Shakespeare trilogy uh, by uh, Jairaj, uh, starting with uh, Kaliyattam, uh, his uh, Deam adaptation of Othello, which is just absolutely extraordinary, uh, followed by uh, his adaptation of Anthony and Cleopatra, and recently uh, a Macbeth, uh, which is, draws on um, uh, Kerala uh, traditions of martial arts. But there are also some really wonderful Tamil adaptations. There's one from uh, the late 40s. Please forgive my pronunciation. Even though I have relatives from Madras, uh, Tamil is not my <laughs> strong suit. Um, but... Uh, uh, a film uh, called uh, Kani in Kadali uh, from the 1940s. See if you get where it comes from. It's about a prince 
who falls in love with his male servant, who is in fact a woman, who is dressed up as a man because she's been separated at sea from her twin brother. <laughs> uh, and the male servant, who is in fact a woman, is asked to woo a princess who falls in love with the male servant, who is in fact a woman. Twelfth night. Done without missing a beat, without any reference to Shakespeare, done with the most wonderful Tamil songs that you still find on YouTube. And then there are brilliant Tamil adaptations in the 1960s of Taming of the Shrew, uh, all of them involving uh, Shivaji Ganesan. Uh, Aravali, and then uh, it's called uh, Pada, uh, Pada, uh, Pada Kata Padinama. At uh, least one of them involving Jaya Lalata. Jaya Lalata <laughs> as Katerina the Shrew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's a superb film. Um, we're going to take audience questions, and that bell is just to indicate if you do have questions, please think them through. We'll take five minutes more to talk between us. And I want to... Frankly, this is a conversation that we can spend five hours on and not start to cover, but I'd like to come to the very political heart of the intent you're also getting at, which is masala as mixture, but masala fundamentally as anti-purity. And what was that very crucial point that you felt both you needed to make, that Shakespeare makes, and that Indian cinema so organically make that we are in danger of losing? Well, it's interesting. I find myself now in the strange situation uh, in my classes of being the native informant for my students about Hindi movies. Because uh, even though they speak, uh, some of them speak Hindi better than me, uh, they've grown up on a diet now of Hollywood and uh, increasingly with uh, the proliferation of view on demand uh, uh, platforms like Netflix and uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, they watch films that are made for viewing in their, their private room. Um, and they see Masala, I, I often do a word association uh, game at the beginning of my course on Masala Shakespeare. I say, what does Masala evoke for you? They say crass, um, cheesy, and there's an interesting word that comes up, auntie. They associate masala movies with what their aunties like. It's embarrassing. It belongs to an older generation. But I think that shows how the aspirationalism of liberalized India is taking people, young people, away from extraordinary cultural resources. And I say this with a smirk, an ironic smirk, because this is at a time when people are being told we do have to go back to Indian resources, but not those ones. We have to go back to the Vedas, to a purely Hindu tradition, in order to rediscover ourselves in our true Indianness. What I like about masala as a way of interrupting this narrative is it's a reminder, as I've talked about before, uh, of India as being a venue for confluence and conversation between multiplicities, multiple traditions. We're fetishizing purity more and more. Uh, and purity is a term that scares me. I think it's drastically overrated. I think uh, the handmaiden of purity is violence, because if we fetishize purity so much, anything that appears in our pure brew that we think shouldn't be there, we angrily try to erase it or throw it out. Uh, when you think about it, the universe is inherently masala. We are inherently masala. Even though we tell stories about ourselves that we say we come from this tradition, this community, the fact of the matter is, the biological fact of the matter is, every one of us has two parents, not one. Even though we may bear one name that supposedly extends back through generations to time immemorial to a, an original patriarch, our genetic pool proliferates the further you go back in time. And in everyone, there is mixture. Every Indian is the result of migration. All of us are the children, the grandchildren of migrants. 
India has done a very good job historically of recognizing this and has historically embraced so many migrant communities. I fear that in this age of purity, we're turning on ourselves to look for some story of origin that makes foreigners of people who are Indian, not just Farangis like me. So my love letter to Masala and to Shakespeare is also a love letter to an idea of India that I fear is being taken to task in ways that are chilling right now. And the coincidence of developments in um, uh, culture and technology that result in my students moving away from Masala into what they think is really good entertainment that comes from the West I see that as a form of neo-colonialism. And on the other hand, voices saying, you can only be truly Indian if you go back and embrace a certain form of Sanskrit. Uh, leaves our students with impoverished imaginations and impoverished understandings of the really rich history of this country. And I'm not just talking about the distant past, I'm talking about the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s as well. Um, and, and the conversation around purity is a whole other conversation, a very crucial one, about whether there is, in fact, something even possibly called purity. But you said it very well, I think, in the book. You said, masala has unexpected dissident power, right? And um, it's interesting that some of the examples, and the reason I did point out the political example is we're at once, of course, unself-aware, but it's also, it speaks to the omnipresence of Shakespeare that in your book you quote three politicians at least. And before we open it up to audience questions, because that is really priceless, will you give us those three examples that you quote of, of politicians quoting Shakespeare? Well, it's interesting. They cover the entire political spectrum, these three politicians. All of them quote Shakespeare in a very Macaulayite way to lend credence to what they're saying. Uh, this is something that politicians do all around the world. As soon as a politician starts quoting Shakespeare, they're a rascal. Because you, you, you know that they're trying to enlist Shakespeare's cultural authority to uh, legitimize something that is probably a bit shady. So, uh, Pranab Da, <laughs> the former president of India. When he was finance minister in the UPA, he was trying to push through a budget that uh, had a few dodgy elements in it. How does he justify the budget? He says, I must be cruel to be kind. <laughs> Quoting Hamlet. No. On the other side of the political spectrum, Smriti Irani, then HRD minister, subsequently minister of textiles, uh, tried to demonize her opponents by saying they can't tell the difference between what is true and false. She says, for them, fair is foul and foul is fair. Quoting the witches from Macbeth. I'll let you work that one out for yourself. And Sitaram Yechuri, talking about the failure of uh, Swachh Bharat and sanitation programs, asks rhetorically, will all the perfumes of Arabia, <laughs> remove the stain, quoting Lady Macbeth. They know not who they quote, <laughs> but, but anyway, I'm much more interested not in what politicians do with Shakespeare, but what filmmakers do with Shakespeare, as you can tell. We'll uh, open it up to questions, if we can have some house lights. There will be a mic going around. If there are any questions, do raise your hands. If not, I have actually enough for all of us. <laughs> I can see oh, one hand at the back, and then we'll... Okay, we can start at the front, and then we go to the back. Uh, very, uh, Sorry, can we have the mic on, please? Hi, Jonathan. That's a very uh, okay. we'll come uh, inspiring... Uh, Sorry, I can't see you because... Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Okay. Okay. It's, very, it's very interesting. I mean, uh, when you started talking about Shakespeare, I thought it's going to be boring, but you really engaged us. Uh, <laughs> and as you said, Shakespeare was thrust upon us, but now I, I also am starting to falling in love. One thing, maybe it might be a controversial question, I don't know, maybe, maybe you can answer or not. You said uh, the India which you love and which I love is under threat and is taken under task. Uh, probably, I, I know what you're referring to, 
If you can elaborate on it, it's good, or, or I leave it up to you. Well, the fact that Shakespeare survives in um, what I'm referring to as the anti-Romeo squad, I think sums it all up. Uh, what is driving the anti-Romeo squads in Uttar Pradesh? It's not some kind of deep feminist commitment. It's in fact a fear of what women might do if they act on their desires and that their desires may take them out of their communities, specifically their Hindu communities. And no matter how much it's dressed up as, this is what men do to our women, the canard of love jihad. Uh, at root, I think the fear that is driving this is not what will men do to women, but of mixture. What if Muslims and Hindus end up becoming romantically involved? What if lower caste and upper caste, Savarna caste people become involved? And Romeo and Juliet is potentially an explosive play in the Indian context. It is, after all, not just about two sweet teenagers who fall in love against the will of their parents, which is already a very Indian scenario. Uh, it's about two lovers from opposed households, from different clans who fight each other to the deaths on the streets. And only after these lovers are sacrificed do the clans realize how ridiculous this communal warfare is. It's no accident that Romeo and Juliet has been uh, an inspiration for more Hindi and, for that matter, Bengali and Telugu and Tamil films than any other. Even Mughle Azam is a version of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Bobby is a version of Romeo and Juliet with a happy ending. Uh, there was, and I wish we still had this film. It uh, has disappeared. But it was a film made in 1947 with Nargis as Juliet, a Muslim Juliet, with a Hindu Romeo. Music by Fez Ahmed Fez, or rather lyrics by Fez Ahmed Fez. We, we still have some of those songs. That was clearly an example of Shakespeare speaking to Indians at the moment of partition. It was a way of articulating the tragedy of partition in a displaced way through Shakespeare. Uh, so that's what I'm referring to. I, uh, actually, this book is in many ways about the enduring trauma of partition, which I think blows through Hindi film like the Lu uh, wind blows through, through Delhi. Um, it's always there, partition, as a sort of unspoken trauma. Uh, and this fascination with people from different communities coming together, mixing, mingling illicitly, then being affirmed in their coming together, uh, is a constant theme in masala films. We're actually losing it. Uh, we get little snippets of it here and there, like in Sairat, a Marathi film, which is a sort of adaptation of Romeo and Juliet about high caste, low caste love. Uh, we get a snippet of it in Gully Boy. I don't know whether you saw that film where a Muslim rapper and a, uh, a Marathi sort of Shiv Sena type uh, 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 family um, produces another rapper who become thick as thieves. Um, but um, I fear that we're losing this because we are more and more insistent on the impermeability of boundaries bec between communities. Yep. The microphone is working now. I hope so. By the way, great, uh, great question. The first question was really good. Uh, you've lived in the West for so many years, mm -hmm. right? And you truly believe uh, that masala is an essential element of uh, any digestible plot, mm -hmm. any plot that you can speak about. But you haven't given a single example, even in a common narrative, of any film of the West, you know, that has embodied Shakespeare. Uh, is it because there's no Naj Gana in those films? <laughs> yeah. Or is it because they don't bring out the human inside you? Because the human inside you loves Naj Gana. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a lovely question. And yes, you've seen something <laughs> about my project, which is uh, very true. Uh, 
It's not that I dislike Western films, uh, but I think uh, the whole machinery, in particular of Hollywood, is about something very different from uh, the Hindi and regional film industries in, in India. Um, originality is fetishized in the West. And why not? I mean, I, I love a good original story too. Uh, but I do think that originality is over fetishized. And I think it's no coincidence that the idea of originality is somehow the uh, hallmark of good art coincides with the rise of capitalism. That originality equals an individual's intellectual property. It's not yours, it's mine. That simply didn't apply in Indian storytelling traditions, where these stories were never stories by X and X. They're apni, our stories. Uh, and part of me loves that. And that apni is most apparent in how people respond to Nach Gana. They know the songs before they come. They start dancing <laughs> in sync with the songs as they're being performed, and they perform them out in the street afterwards. There's a way in which the film migrates from what's on screen into the bodies of the people watching, and it doesn't matter if they're Muslim or Hindu, upper class or lower class, upper caste or lower caste. We are all performing mitava. Right? Uh, that is so radically different from a culture in which originality is the, the benchmark. Right? Uh, but it is very Shakespearean, because one thing that had always puzzled me was how did so many illiterate people come out of Shakespeare's plays, absolutely transformed by them? And we have evidence that people would, after watching a Shakespeare play, remember three quarters of the scripts. They'd go to publishers and say, I just heard Hamlet. Let me tell it to you now. And they'd get a lot of it wrong, but they'd get vast chunks of it right. And why? Because they were having the same response to the music of Shakespeare that Indian film audiences would have to the Nachgana episodes. They'd remember them, they'd sing them, they'd dance them, they'd repeat them to each other. These are apni kahaniyam, not Shakespeare's. Uh, so, yes, I think you put your finger on something very important about how we imagine stories, who possesses them, uh, who they belong to. Yeah. And I'll try to be quick in my answer now. Are there any women in the audience who have a question? Because I, yes, please. For your wonderful understanding of the Indian scene. Thank you. I, I rarely come across an Englishman having such depth of knowledge. And you, thank you. Although I'm a key, you, you, you could you could really replace Tom Otter who was the actor on the Indian Hindi cinema for various roles as an Englishman. <laughs> it's fantastic, fantastic. And your recollection, memory, everything is top class. <laughs> and I heard you mention Auckland and New Zealand, that's the, the other end of the hemisphere, and also the United States. Now, I have been a student of Shakespeare, having studied in a school, English medium school in Delhi, and we did read the As You Like It. I still remember the King Lear, I remember Charles, I remember Touchstone, I remember Melancholic Jack, and uh, the famous All the World's a Stage. And all of us are players in it. At first the child, puking, the puking in the nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy, unwilling to school with the shining morning face and all that sort of thing. So, uh, these things are, I mean, something which you just cannot forget. And just for the information of the people here, I am plus 80. So, uh, at this age, to recall and remember Shakespeare is something amazing. Now, I, I don't have to go further into what you described as the link between Shakespeare and the Indian 
society or the Indian fabric of inclusiveness or the high and the low. But this is there in every part of the world. Why are we singling out India? Don't you find it in England between Northern Ireland and uh, the Irish Republic? Don't you find it between Israel and Palestinians? Don't you find in the United States between the whites and the non-whites? There is difference all over the place. But this has been, in India, a very heterogeneous society mm -hmm. uh, subject to invasions by different people over thousands of years. Mm -hmm. So that fabric has got integrated, yeah. and there, there has been various compulsions. Sir, I'm sorry no, yep. to interrupt, but it, was that a question? As in, if you'd like to phrase it as a question, he'll probably find it easier well, to Well, uh, he, he, he could react because before I end, sure. I would just like to add a little bit of a comic to the whole thing sure. and not make it sound very serious. There, there was a section I read that somebody claimed that Shakespeare was actually Shakespeare. You understand? <laughs> Yes. The second one said, not to be left behind, he said, Shesha Payar. Ha. So, Rambanala. So, that's the way it is, and you, yep. you could react. Yep. Thank you. Uh, just uh, thank you. Very quickly, uh, the reason I, I don't think I'm singling out India, I, I'm just invested in it. Uh, this is where I live, this is where I imagine I'll be for the rest of my life. Uh, I also think India has extraordinary traditions of syncretism, pluralism, multiplicity that it needs to be reminded of in this moment. Uh, I like what you say about the Indian fabric. Uh, I think fabric is a very useful metaphor like masala because fabric involves a weaving together of many threads. I'd also like at this point to draw attention to my Indian fabric here. Uh, which is a tribute to Zinat Aman, uh, who apparently was your last guest she at was, uh, Algebra. She was and I'm at, feeling absolutely crushed in that I wasn't invited to the same Algebra event. Soon, we hope. And um, I mean, the book is outside, but before we end, I would like you in just uh, briefly to tell us about the very interesting narrative structure of the book itself, because it is written as a five-act play, as a Shakespearean play. Will you just give us a little glimpse of that? It's written both as a five-act Shakespearean play and as a Hindi film, because the five acts are interrupted by item numbers all the time. Um, so there are five acts. The first one is called Khandans. It's about masala families. The second one is called Jugalbandis. It's about dialogues. Uh, the third one uh, is, uh, goodness, I'm forgetting. It's, it's about Natak. Uh, all the world is a stage. It's a very Shakespearean idea, but it's also Zindagi ek natak hai, as Asha Bonsle sang. It's a very Indian idea. Uh, the Ras Lila, the cosmic dance that all of existence is a performance, uh, is very Indian. Uh, the fourth act, I called, it's an ugly term, Dardnak uh, Kahanis. Uh, Tragic That's tales. Right. There's interestingly no word for tragedy in Hindi or Urdu. Um, and the, the last one is Tufans, about the storms in King Lear, Pericles. Uh, but of course, Hindi cinema, cinema all over the country has always loved a good Tufan. They're all in interconnected. By um, the book. <laughs> it's got a very nice cover. You'll see it features... Sheikh Peer on the cover. <laughs> and on that note, thank you so much, Gil, for an absolutely fabulous conversation.